of the living God fall afresh on us as we gather in this place. Allow your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts as we worship thee this day. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that all who worship this day, that we may present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto thee, and that we may present ourselves as a temple of the Holy Spirit, wherein thou wilt dwell forevermore. Amen. Well, good morning, Lake Helen. What a wonderful day. What a great day it is to see y'all here. I hope that you came looking for the Almighty God, because I will tell you, he's here. And I said it, because that's what he said. So amen to that. I hope you will experience his love today and be sprinkled by a little bit of the hope of the Almighty, because we all need that. Amen? Amen. amen. All right. Let me remind you just of a couple of things that you need to know uh, these days. First, there is a new church directory and an update out in the narthex for those of you that would like one of those that Diane and her membership team recently put out there. I want to give thanks this morning to Lowell and a team of people that put on the concert last Sunday. I know a bunch of you guys were probably here. I was here, it was a great concert. We had something like 70 adults and about 10 kids who were singing all kinds of songs and just had a wonderful, wonderful time. So I hope you will enjoy the future concerts that we will have, because we're having one in November and one in December as well. It's nice to see Tom and Tina back. They, are, they, they immediately got back and I immediately put them to work. They've been on vacation like forever, so I had to give them something to do. So they are doing our pressure today. It was nice to have them here. Congratulations to Miss Sue Wilson down here. Sue just finished her second lay speaking class, and she is going to be certified officially next Sunday as a certified lay servant. So she put in a lot of work to do that. So let's give her a round of applause. Tomorrow is food pantry day. And there's always a need for people, especially people that are strong, can lift big bags of groceries. And if you can help, we only want one or two people, but uh, there are two shifts on the two Sundays per month if you do that. If that's something you would like to, to do, or if you know somebody who would like to help, they don't have to be members of our church. We would love to engage a few more people to help in the ministry of that church. In the handouts today, there's a little information, what I call an information sheet, to describe something that's going to be going on in this church on October the 13th as an evening event. We'll do dessert. And as you can see on that slip, we've got to talk about a couple of really important issues. That is a, an event that is designed for every member of the church. Every member. So please put that on your radar screen and come out and find out what's going on. We will talk about the future priorities of this church and some of the issues going on in the larger Methodist denomination. So it's a really, really important meeting. And Gina is pointing out something today. What are you pointing out, girl? Well, we need some people to do flowers. Oh, flowers. Yeah. So we're talking about the flowers up here. You guys can sign up. People will get the flowers, they'll put the flowers up here, they'll take the flowers somewhere. All you guys need to do is sign up on the calendar in that corner out in the North X and put uh, money in the, in the uh, plate sometime to cover the expense of that. There are special envelopes to do that so we know that the money was for flowers. But we would appreciate your participation in that. I don't know about y'all, but I think the beauty of the flowers is well worth every penny that anybody chooses to put in. So we appreciate your help on that. And with that, Mike, I'm going to turn it back over to you to get us into worship. This 
morning, our call to worship comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and will lay here before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of Man, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing a hymn together this morning, Because He Lives. It's number 364. I'll give you a moment to turn there. We're going to do all three stanzas. Because He Lives, it's 364 in your hymnal.
great. So, hope you guys enjoyed it in here. Hope you guys out your car and enjoyed it. Hope you guys are watching all the video. Enjoyed that song as well. You know, it's nice to remind ourselves of what we believe. And so right now we're going to recite together the Apostles' Creed, which is in your bulletin, which is basically a summary of what we, along with a lot of other Protestant denominations, believe. Join with me, please. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life and everlasting. Amen. 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 I want you to be praying for a, a good friend of mine, Reverend Pastor Mimi Rodriguez. Mimi is doing well. She is recovering from breast cancer surgery. surgery. She's actually back to work for just a very part-time basis while she recovers from that. I'm also uh, asking for some of you to pray about your awareness of somebody that might have a room that we could rent to somebody that's looking for a room, preferably a, a low-cost room, but nevertheless a decent room. So if you have a room in your house, near your house, that you're willing to share with somebody, you can reach out to me and we'll make that happen. I'm going to ask Abel to start coming up. Today is World Communion Day. World Communion Day. And to celebrate that, I have asked Abel to come up and do something that I don't believe we've ever done in this church. But come down here, brother. But I want us to do it on a more regular basis. And that is, we're going to say a prayer in a different language. I asked Abel to do Chinese. But he just concluded that, that, wasn't, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so today, we're going to do a Spanish prayer, and then I'll finish after that. All right. Good morning. Buenos dias, make heaven. Very packed to the day. Guys, I want to start by saying thank you. Me and my wife um, can embrace this. I get emotional. Please stick with me. Yeah, embrace this, yeah, took us in as a family, and I want to thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pray for our pastors, our leaders, and my members, and the members' family today. So, that's what I'm going to uh, pray in Spanish. So, gracias, Señor, por el día que nos dio, el día que nos dio hoy. Hoy aún quiero orar por los pastores, los líderes y los miembros de la iglesia. Quiero orar por el mundo de los otros, Lord, que tú pones tu mano encima del mundo de los otros. Te pido mucha oración por los otros. Gracias por todo y la oportunidad para la negativa, la oración, para mi gente, tu gente. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. 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 Join me in prayer. Our Father, we come to you this day with grateful hearts because we are grateful for your many blessings. We come to you with expectant hearts as we eagerly await to observe how you will bless us and our church in this coming week. We come to you with humble hearts as we listen to how you want us to serve you and your kingdom this week. We pray for those in need this day. 
those in addiction this day, those in pain this day, Lord, let us be the light that leads them to you and to our church, that they may know that you, that you alone, are the solution that they need. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now we have a, a really neat surprise today. Normally on communion Sunday we give our teachers a break, but they decided they would rather teach the kids today than to take a break. Now that's a blessing. So as the kids leave and go through this door and follow these two delightful ladies, both of whom I know, you and I get to sing one more time, but one day somebody else is going to be singing, that's not me, but we're going to sing, Jesus loves me, so join with me as we sing. Here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so.
watching God's grace at work. We continue. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king's king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was already incarcerated. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph who attended to their needs while they were in prison. After they had been in custody for quite some time, each of the two men had a dream on the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. We both had dreams, they said. When Joseph saw them the following morning, he looked at them, noticed that something was wrong, and said, Why are you so sad? And they said, Because we have no one to interpret our dreams. So Joseph said something pretty profound. Doesn't the interpretation of dreams belong to God? Tell me your dream. Remember, Joseph been involved with dreams for a while. He's getting pretty good at this. So Joseph accepted the role to interpret their dreams on their behalf. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said, In my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will restore you to your original position. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to. But when all goes well, he said, Joseph said, remember me and show me kindness. Tell him about me, my position, and what's going on with me. For I have done nothing, Joseph said, to deserve being put in a dungeon. Joseph is saying, hey, I'm innocent. But yet, here I am in prison. Again, I'm reminded of the numerous stories that you probably have heard as well as I on the news about people who get incarcerated and say they're innocent. I think after the Joseph story, I may begin to take those but more seriously than I have in the past, to be honest. But we continue. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are also three days. And then three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole. And the birds will eat away your flesh. That's, that's, that's not a good story. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. And he gave a feast for all his officials. And he brought in the cupbearer and he brought in the baker. And just as Joseph had said, he restored the cupbearer to his original role, and the baker, well, the baker got the short end of the stick, let's just leave it there. <laughs> then the chief cupbearer forgot Joseph, didn't mention him to Pharaoh at all. Meanwhile, two years later, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river 
there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. And after them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. Pharaoh fell asleep again, and he had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. But in the morning, his mind was troubled, and he sent for his musicians and magicians and wise people, asking for them to interpret his dream. But no one could. Then, two years later, the cupbearer says, hey, today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with me and other servants, and he imprisoned me. And while I was there, several of us had dreams. And there was a young Hebrew man there who interpreted our dreams. And everything he told us came out to be true, exactly as he had interpreted them. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon, he's in prison. And when he had shaved and changed clothes, he came to Pharaoh. I mean, this, this is like Joseph's big moment here. From prison to the palace. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And remember Joseph, that really brash, arrogant, self-centered guy? Here's Joseph's response now, about 10 years later. I cannot do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So then Pharaoh told Joseph the story, the same story that I just read to you. So Joseph says to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now please notice here how important dreams are in this story as a way of God speaking to people. And he speaks to y'all in dreams, or in your prayers, or in your meditation, or in your scripture reading. And I really hope that you know how God will speak to you. Because if you don't know that, then how will you know when God speaks to you? And I promise you, he will speak to you. We continue on. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven heads of grain are seven years. It's one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterwards are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain. Seven years of good fortune, followed by seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. 
seven years of abundance throughout the land of Egypt. And seven years of famine will follow them. Then all of the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten. And the famine will ravage the land. The abundance will not be remembered. Because the famine that follows will be so severe. You know, I don't know about y'all, but is it true that we forget about the good things in our life when we have moments of bad times? The current captures our attention, and we forget about the past and the good. I think there's a lesson there. I think there's a lesson there. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Talking to Joseph. You shall be in charge of my palace. You shall be in charge of all of my people. All of my people will submit to your orders and yours alone. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. This is Joseph, y'all. That brash, arrogant young kid who was hated by his brothers, who wore that coat at all the wrong times, tossed into a pit, sold into slavery, went to Egypt, thrown into prison. Man, that has just got the resume of somebody you want to hire. <laughs> I don't think so. Pretty incredible story. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He made him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Continues on, Pharaoh blessed him, gave him a new name, gave him a wife, later had kids. What a story! Hometown boy makes good. Joseph, son of Jacob and Rebecca gets the promotion of a lifetime. So we need to remember Jacob, the father, and his brothers are clueless about this. Clueless. They have no idea what's going on with Joseph. Jacob still thinks he's dead. Let's continue. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh as king of Egypt. Joseph went out throughout Pharaoh's land, traveled, and during the seven years of abundance, he gathered as much food as he could and he stored it away for the future. There's a lesson there, too. But we need to start skipping around just to move ahead a little bit. The famine comes, hits Egypt, hits all the surrounding land. Meanwhile, before the famine, Joseph had accumulated all this food that was his plan, his idea, his thought. That was just probably his primary job, I guess. But the family, his family, Jacob and his other brothers were still back in Canaan. And the family had up their food. 
The word got out. No big surprise that Egypt had food. You go down and buy it. So Jacob got several of his sons to go and get some food. We, we continue. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's younger blood brothers, the only two brothers that were born to Rebekah. And a lot of other brothers, but not blood brothers through the same mother. Because Jacob was afraid that harm might come to them. I hear this is the same Jacob that had the problem with being a showing favorites. I mean, Joseph was a favorite. Now, Benjamin's a favorite. Same kind of issues and dynamics in the family. So Jacob's sons went through the family to Egypt to get food. And they arrived. Now, Joseph was governor of the land. The person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, hear this well, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now how good is your memory? Do you remember that one of the first dreams that Joseph had was his brothers bowing down to him and he then told them about it and he told his dad about it and they said, yeah, fat chance. Those are the same dreams that we're seeing living, lived out right here in Scripture. Now, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them, asking them, where do you come from? They said, we come from Canaan. And we came to buy food. And although Joseph recognized them, they did not recognize Joseph. Had no clue who this guy was. He probably didn't fit the image of who they thought their brother would be by now. Remember where, the, where they come from. So Joseph plays the role when he interacts with his brothers, and he forces them to leave. <clears throat> One of the brothers there, Simeon, to go back home. And he had told them, I want you to bring your younger brother next time. Joseph wanted to see Benjamin, who was the younger brother. And in order to make that transaction happen, he made them leave one of the brothers there. Now he gave them food. And us to them, he returned every penny of their money in the food. So they go back home. <clears throat> Jacob just doesn't get it sometimes. The brothers return home, meet with Jacob. Jacob says this, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more. He doesn't yet know that Joseph's alive in Egypt. Simeon is no more. Well, actually he's in jail. In Egypt. But as far as Jacob is concerned, he's not there. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. So then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I don't bring Benjamin back when we go. But Jacob said, Nope. My son, as if it's his only son, my son will not go down there with you. He is the only one I have left. Well, not exactly, but from his eyes, I guess so. If harm comes to him on the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. Uh, after a significant debate over time, 
The family decides that since they ran out of food again, that they're going to have to take Benjamin and go back to Egypt. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where we end the story today. You'll have to come back for part four on another day for the family to be reunited. Reunited, I can talk. But we've had a lot to learn today. I want you to think about the story. I hope the story spoke to you. I, this is the most fabulous story in the entire Bible. It is absolutely rich with drama, all kinds of good lessons. What do you learn? So I would just point out a couple of things, and maybe you would point out some, some more to me. One of the greatest lessons is you can never look a kid and figure out where he's going in life. Who would have thunk that this kid who's got an ego the size of Texas, who wears clothes that are weird, remember that colored robe thing? He's arrogant, he's egotistical, speaks of the dreams about himself, which in hindsight was not really all about Joseph. And here he is, candy. Is that a wow? God does some amazing, amazing things. Now, the people in Egypt would have looked at Joseph, who they didn't know very well, and thought, he just got thrown into prison, for Pete's sake. What kind of an idiot is this? He had one of the greatest jobs around. He was working for Potiphar. Who was one of the assistants to Pharaoh? Well, that's got to be a great job. And he does something dumb, he gets thrown into prison. At least that's what society would have thought. Erroneously. Remember that Joseph was falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, falsely sentenced. The same Joseph that, by the way, did not do a single thing wrong. Not one. You know, if there's a figure in this entire story about Joseph that you look at, it's hard to find something that Joseph does wrong. He's a very unique figure in the bomb in the drama of the Bible. The one that's worth your study and your attention. It's good to remember by looking at this story how people you know, people like, like you guys. Notice, notice I didn't include myself, I just you guys. If you're involved in the legal system here, in our country, you have every opportunity to do what happened in this story, and that is to work justice to make you look better and making somebody else pay for something they didn't do. That is why it is so important that in our justice system we evaluate and corroborate witnesses and what people say. It's really a scary thought to observe this story and understand its impact on us. It is a great, great story. Anyway, as our story ends, Joseph has been approached by his own family and Joseph gives them food. And honestly, I think Joseph deserves a gold star for what he did. Pretty, pretty good. I mean, his story of prison to palace could be a bestseller when Rebecca decides to write it. I don't know, do you write it? I do. Well, there you go. There's my idea for your next bestseller. God's ability, y'all, is unlimited to transform and change. It's unbounded. Joseph is the only example you'll ever need to remember. Look at what happened to this kid. That's God at work, y'all. Some of you here today may need a transformation. And if it's not you, then maybe it's somebody that you know. Family member, a friend. I'm thinking right.
right now of two people that need transformation that I know. First of all, let's agree we all need transformation. There ain't none of us that have got it figured. But the two I'm going to mention to you this past week, and by the way, these are both true stories, and both of these happened in the last week. I had to pick up a guy off the street and stagger literally with him back to his house. Because as the saying goes, he was drunk as a skunk. He couldn't get up. He couldn't stand it. And I'm not sure he much cared. He needs the transformation that you and I know about. And all I can tell you well, I'm really not. I'm trying to hand it off to another guy that does a much better job than I do. And that would be God. Then I have a friend with a daughter. Her daughter is a drug addict. Her daughter has four kids. And as predictable it rained on a rainy day. The daughter was supposed to show up this week to meet with her counselor, or I guess probably the counselor for the kid, to have a, a regular meeting with her kid. She decided to go get high, missed the meeting, and therefore will once again lose custody of the kid. God can transform the man I spoke of. God can transform the woman I just spoke of. And if you need such transformation in your life, I hope that today you will come up at the end of this service and pray with me. And pray in just a really simple sentence. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I'm ready. I'm so ready for a new life and a different life. I want to be transformed to experience your love and your guidance in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why we're in church. That is why church exists. That's what we're supposed to do to the community. I mean, I'm glad y'all are here to listen to me. But I'll tell you what, you really want to listen to him more than you want to listen to me. And even more than you want to listen to Rebecca. As much as I like listening to Rebecca, don't get me wrong. So I hope you'll consider that and what's going on in your life. And with that, we are going to transition to a very special part of services on the first Sunday in this church. Something called communion. You have, or are given, a little packet. These are new packets, by the way. You can actually get out the way. If you haven't tried some of the others in the past few months, you won't understand how, how good that is. The Methodist Church has open communion. I don't care where you came from, I don't care who you are, as long as you're here and you love Jesus and you want to seek his will for your life, then you are welcome to do communion with us. And just so you know, we do communion every Wednesday night in our prayer service at 5.30, right in here. So if you ever seek come to a prayer service or just to meditate and or to get communion come on Wednesday night. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him
them and seek to grow into his likeness. Let us draw near with faith and make our humble confession and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. We do not presume to come to this your table or scores, trusting in our own goodness, but in your unfailing mercies, you are not worthy, we are not worthy, that you should receive us. But give your word and we shall be healed. Amen. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, that is proof of God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you made us in your image to love and to be loved. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, Jesus Christ, you delivered us from the slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up, for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. The body of Christ, broken for you. If you want, you can take out the wafer and you can eat that right now. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for me for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may consume the juice. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, and on these gifts, bread and wine, may they be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be, for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in his final victory, and we feast at his heavenly name. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Join me, if you will, in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The rise of the King, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This will serve as our benediction. 
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Take care. God bless. Go and serve.